Hello, this is Dr. Christy Patton Lukes, a chemical engineering professor at Missouri S&T. We are looking at now at chapter five from our textbook, which is the second law of thermodynamics. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at the reversible adiabatic compression or expansion and the irreversible adiabatic compression or expansion in preparation for looking more closely at the Carnot cycle. So, we previously said that delta S for the universe is the combination of what happens in the system and the surroundings, right? So the system and everything not in the system makes up everything. So if we want to analyze these two pieces, the system and the surrounding, let's start with the system because that's what we understand better. And we can write about this in various ways, but... I can call it delta S for the system, but really that's just what we would probably normally just call delta S, which is delta or the difference between S at the end minus the beginning. We could also do this in an integral form, right? This would be the same thing. This is the most useful form because we have a definition for dS that says that it is dq for a reversible process divided by temperature. Now, in our particular case here, we're saying it's adiabatic, therefore this is identically zero. Now this is very useful because we therefore will be able to generalize, but for now just take this as, yeah, this one case means that adiabatic and reversible means isentropic. But you can, in fact, also show that if it is isentropic, if delta S equals zero, it must also be reversible and adiabatic. So this next question then is what's happening to the surroundings? Well, the key thing for us to note here is that Key, the Q for our system is the opposite of Q for our surroundings. And so in this case, it's all zero. And so if Q to the surroundings is also zero, then delta S for the surroundings is zero. And therefore, delta S for the universe is zero plus zero, or just zero. So what about for an irreversible adiabatic expansion or compression process? Now, we're going to do this so that Q for the reversible is the same as Q for the irreversible. I'm going to set that. So in other words, this is all zero in this particular case. But I also want to sort of be looking at some more general truths along the way also. So I know what Q is here, but what can we say about the work? And really, in particular, I want to compare the amount of work for my irreversible process to the reversible process. What we've been told about a reversible process is depends on whether the work is being done to the system or by the system. So let's start with the case where work is positive. So if this is my system here, positive work means work is going into the system. And what we were told is that a real process will require more work input than the ideal. So work for the irreversible process, the real one, is more than the work for a reversible process. What about the case where work is negative? So in this case, for my system, the work is being taken out of the system. Okay, that's negative work. And so work is being produced by the system. What we've been told is that less work is produced in a real process than would be ideal. Now that's magnitude-wise. So the work for a real process irreversible, okay, 
the magnitude of that work for a real process is less than the magnitude of the work for a reversible process. But these are negative quantities, so if you take off the absolute value signs, that's equivalent to multiplying through by a negative. <clears throat> and so we end up with work for the irreversible is greater than work for the reversible. So for our sign convention, in all cases, the reversible work is less than the irreversible work. So now let's take that concept, right, that work re irreversible is the larger of the two, and look at the first law. Now, du is the change in Q plus W if I neglect kinetic and potential energy. And this would be true whether I'm talking about the reversible process or the irreversible process. Right? But remember, we said Q reversible and Q irreversible are the same quantity. We fixed that. And for this amount of heat transfer, we're trying to get a handle on the work. Okay, so we have this. So if work irreversible is larger than work reversible, regardless of sign, then this tells me that delta U for the ir irreversible has to be greater than delta U for the reversible. Now, let's just say both start at T1. The reversible stops at T2 and the irreversible stops at T3. So if they both are starting at the same temperature, what can we say then about the final temperatures? Now, if this is just a change in temperature, okay, or if it is an ideal gas, either of those cases, then what I'm gonna find is that delta U for this process is going to go from the starting temperature to the final temperature for CVDT and the starting temperature to the final temperature of CVDT. And we know that the irreversible, so the T3 case, is greater than the reversible. But CV isn't changing and CV is just the way it's defined, it has to be positive. And so if CV is always positive, then this requires that T3 is greater than T2 for all of my irreversible possibilities. So now let's look at <clears throat> this delta S for the irreversible process. And since this is path independent, I could think of this as being a reversible path to T2 and then an irreversible path to T3. So let's just compare what's going on at states 2 to 3. So delta S from 2 to 3, okay, my when I stopped being reversible and went to being irreversible, is dQ as if it were reversible over T. Or I could also say CPDT over T. But again, we know that C sub P is positive. We know T3 is greater than T2. And so therefore, since T is absolute temperature, it's all positive, delta S has to be positive, okay? So therefore, if I look at delta S from my irreversible process, it is delta S from one to two to three, I could say, 
which is delta S 1 to 2 plus delta S 2 to 3. Delta S 1 to 2 was the reversible portion, so that's 0. Delta S 2 to 3 is going to be this something positive. As defined up here. And so what we get is that delta S for an irreversible process is positive. Now what about the surroundings? Okay, Q for the surroundings, well because the effect of my process is not going to change the infinite universe, then Q is going to be just simply be, um, it's going to have no effect on the temperature, so therefore it will be isothermal. So therefore, when I look at this DQ reversible over T for the surroundings, T is constant, and so I end up with this. And in this particular case, remember I said I was trying to do it a little bit generally, for this particular case, this is equal to zero because Q is zero. So what we end up learning from these two little examples is that delta S for the universe is positive for the irreversible process and delta S for the universe is equal to zero for the reversible process. Now we only did this for adiabatic expansion or compression, but we will we'll see that others have done a lot of studies of this and they generalize this. So this is a really important result. What we want to do next is look at what happens in a Carnot cycle.